Oh, got him. It's gross. <laughs> Hey everybody, Nate Luby here. We are in the beautiful Grand Teton National Park. We shot some landscapes. Autumn just showed us how to photograph the moon. And uh, I'm here now, we're gonna go find some wildlife. Let's get started. Tons of beautiful birds out here. There's a lot of different types of gulls. They actually would be seagulls, but we're over a bay right now, so they are technically bagels. A Grand Teton National Park just butts right up against um, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which is this massive wilderness area with Yellowstone National Park kind of as the, uh, the centerpiece, but there's tons of preserved wilderness, national forest, all the way down to the Wind River Mountains uh, a little bit away from us here. And so there's just this massive preserved wilderness. And because of that, you get this beautiful ecosystem that's fully intact. It's not just bisected by tons of roads and cities that interrupt these animals' habitats. There's tons of wildlife, tons of biodiversity. There's eight species of ungulates. There's multiple species of predators. You know, there's bears, both grizzly and black bears. We have wolf packs that are native to the area. There's, um, there's bobcats, there's wolverines, there's mountain lions, you know, there's just, tons of, of opportunity to find cool wildlife and to me this is as good as it gets so it's one of the like true most wild places in north america i love photographing wildlife partially because it's so unpredictable but also because i love that the animals have their own personality uh, it's kind of like having a pet but you don't get to snuggle with them unfortunately but it's fun because uh, the first step for wildlife for me is learning a little bit about your animal that you're trying to find the more you know about its behavior and, and their um, desires and their wants, the easier it is to find these animals. And the more you understand about how they're gonna behave, the easier it is to position yourself to get the shot that you want. And for me, that's so fun because you get to learn so much. I'm kind of a biologist at heart. You get to learn about these animals and then you get to see them interacting with their environment. Earlier we were driving and I saw a couple moose that were way off in the distance. And part of the reason I was able to see that while driving even is because I, I know enough about moose. I knew that was their habitat. It was kind of marshy wetlands full of willows, which they love to eat. And it's one of those where when you see that standing deep water with some, some leafy greens growing in it, you just know that moose are gonna be nearby. Uh, and then I sort of, I don't know, I've sort of like trained my brain to filter through the noise of like trees and grass and look for like the specific brown of the moose or the movement, you know, the trees and the bushes are not walking. And so if there's any movement at all, if you can kind of train your brain a little bit to like keep an eye out for that, even while driving, it's a little easier to spot the animals. And with an added benefit that it's safer for both you and them while you're driving around as well, because unfortunately cars are one of the main killers of animals nowadays. One of the main things I'm trying to do while photographing wildlife is to tell the story of the animal, not just where it lives and what it's doing there, but its personality as well. It's a really common beginner move to see an animal and just get excited and take a photo of the animal and it being in the frame is good enough. And that's really fun. But as you progress, it, you should start looking at what the animal's doing and what body part of the animal is the focus of the frame. You see a lot of instances of you know, deer, elk, moose, where their heads are down, they're eating, they're maybe turned away from the camera. And it kind of looks like a vacation snapshot, but it's not wildlife photography. You know, we're all trying to elevate our game. We're trying to take the best photo we can. So I've started trying to be more patient as best I can. And I wait for that animal to turn and face me. I wait for it to lift its head and look into the camera or look off, off to the side at a different animal, but just give like an, some intent, give me, a facial expression, some body posture, 
Uh, one of my signature moves is I love animals with a lifted leg. The front leg in motion, it shows that they're going somewhere, they're doing something. So that, that's the kind of thing that I use to inform my decisions for wildlife photography as well. I'm not looking to just have a camera pointed at an animal and have a photo with an animal in it. I'm trying to show that this animal is alive and they're doing things. They're also slow moving and cute, so a lot of people don't take them seriously, but bison can ruin your day really fast. So I guess I'd like to remind everyone to please be careful while you're out shooting wildlife, even if they just look like giant fancy cows. If you're looking down from above, you just stand up on the roadway or whatever. It kind of feels like seeing an animal in the zoo, but if you can get down low, you sort of immerse yourself in their environment. And it, to me, tells a better story of who the animal is and where they live. Yeah, bison are almost always in herds together, so it tends to look a little cluttered when you're trying to get a, you know, like a portrait photo of them, because there's always a, a butt or a tail of a different animal in the frame. So it's kind of a, a patience game. You have to wait for them to stop eating the grass and lift their head up so you can actually see the subject. And you kind of have to wait for them to wander around. And I try to find one that finally wanders off on its own and focus on that one, wait for it to lift its head and then try to get the shot there. Uh, I do really love this lens because the depth of field you get at f2.8 on a 400 millimeter is just super thin, so you get this great subject isolation, and then the bokeh is so smooth and so soft. Uh, that I just love how silky everything looks. For me, there's a couple different types of photography for wildlife. I like to get the close-up headshot portraits, but I'm also a big fan of photographing wider out, I call them environmental portraits. So that's something that you can shoot on a 24 to 70 or a 70 to 200 and show the animal in its native habitat. You know, a smaller elk with a big, beautiful mountain behind it, or a moose swimming in the lake, kind of showing where they live and what they do. And that's something that's a little bit more approachable with, you know, slightly less expensive gear as well. The animal's a little bit too far away to shoot a tight headshot, um, which is like the traditional wildlife photography where you get like all the details, a close-up shot of the face. But here we're just trying to showcase the animal in its native habitat. So I'm actually shooting maybe around like 100 millimeters. It's just a 70 to 200. And I'm shooting wide so you can see the mountains in the background, you can see the trees and the grass, and the animal is just part of the landscape. It's one of my favorite ways to shoot because it's kind of a hybrid between wildlife and landscape photography. It's like the true essence of nature photography. Well, we weren't here for long, but sometimes that's all it takes. If you are in the right spot at the right time, it doesn't take long to get the shot. A lot of animal encounters are very brief and they feel uh, almost instantaneous after the fact. So I like to go into them as prepared as I can. So my ideal setup is a longer prime lens, like the 400 or the 600 G Master. And then I'll have a second body with either the 70 to 200 or the 100 to 400. I've had a lot of encounters where an animal's really far away. I'm using a huge telephoto lens to try and get as close as possible. And then they walk right past you. And as they get closer and closer, you're going to find out that you're shooting like just the bison's tongue or something. <laughs> um, and it, if you only have the one camera, you're definitely limited. You're kind of locked in. Uh, so I like to have a little bit of flexibility there. And so I'll go with both cameras and I'll shoot with my big prime. And then as they get closer, I'll switch over to the 7200. I'll zoom out a little bit. I'll get that wider shot and try to show the animal in its native habitat. And then you end up going home with some diversity of shots. It feels a little hectic with two cameras and you're trying to balance which one you're using at what moment. But uh, it's great because you might literally have 30 seconds with a mountain lion or something. You know, if you're ever fortunate enough to see one, you might get five photos taken. And so you wanna make sure that you maximize that time. It's a bunch of elk just crossed the road, but they are being pretty shy. So I'm actually not sure if we're gonna be able to get a shot. Continuous shooting is a huge benefit also, um, not just while getting started, but I mean, for any wildlife photographer, 
the animals are moving and no matter how good your reflexes are on that single frame, you're probably gonna slightly miss the body posture that you're looking for. So I'm a big fan of continuous shooting. And I don't mean you have to set it on the highest 30 frames per second on your A1 and go home with 7,000 images of a pelican, right? But uh, there's something to be said for even five frames per second, just to make sure you get a little variety and it's kind of a fun way also to learn about the animals. You might surprise yourself with a shot that you wanted and then find out that two or three frames later actually is cooler. Uh, and that's a good way to learn and improve as, as you move forward in your journey. Just had a huge herd of elk cross over this ridge. And there's just some great sunset colors uh, with some like colorful clouds behind the Grand Teton. And I love this little ridge line in front of it. Uh, this is the Sony 70 to 200 millimeter F2.8 uh, G Master Mark II. And I love it. I mean, F2.8 is great right now. We're a couple minutes from sunset here, so it's getting a little bit darker out. And I actually still like a little bit of depth of field, even when you're shooting a really like big, wide landscape. It's still nice to have like a little bit of background blur and a little bit of your foreground being sharp. It just helps with that subject isolation and gives a little more depth to your image. So. Uh, big fan of this lens. It's definitely my like go-to secondary lens when the 400 is a little bit too tight. Another benefit of shooting wide open or wide-ish open is you can keep a faster shutter speed, which for wildlife in general is going to be a great way to do things. I like to aim for at least a 1 1,000th of a second shutter, especially for faster moving animals. Um, for example, up in Alaska when the bears are chasing salmon, I love to freeze that motion. Here, if you're shooting something like a bison that's moving a little slower, you can get away with a slower shutter speed, but uh, I like to keep it sharp. I hate to get home and see there's a little motion blur, even if the animal isn't moving fast, if uh, my tripod isn't quite as steady or my hands are shaking, I like to just eliminate all of that risk and shoot at a faster shutter speed. ISO is one of the like last things that a lot of photographers think about and a lot of people are scared of high ISO and I have to admit I'm, I'm kind of one of them. I don't love a noisy photo from shooting at high ISO. The cameras are getting amazingly good at it but there's also a lot of tools to remove that noise in post and so these days honestly I don't even bat an eye if I'm at 3200 ISO or even 6400. Um, Another tool that I love to use is shooting on auto ISO, which sounds a little bit sacrilegious, but like I was saying, we have these really short experiences with these animals. And I've missed so many photos from trying to fiddle with the settings in a scenario like this, where the animal will go from sun into shade back into sun. It's nobody's thumbs are fast enough to turn all those dials. So if you can get your shutter speed set to where you want for sharp, captures, you have your aperture set to exactly what you want for the depth of field that you find best. Auto ISO is a beautiful way to trust your camera and to kind of work with your equipment instead of against your equipment and just let it make the adjustments for you. You'll be shocked how good these cameras are these days. As for aperture, I love to shoot wide open, especially on a lens like this because that really thin depth of field you get at f2.8 to me is just beautiful and you get great subject isolation. If your subject is in kind of a busy background like a forest, that's a great way to still make the animal stand out from a potentially cluttered feeling background. Uh, one of the benefits of such a high quality lens as this is that at f2.8 it still looks great. Another thing I like to do, if you're somewhere not with such dappled lighting like this, but with consistent lighting conditions, uh, say that you know the sun has risen, there's not a cloud in the sky, you know it's gonna be sunny for the next couple hours, I will just meter my exposure right then and there and I won't touch it. So it's just not a thing I have to think about. Look for something bright and meter it at plus two and then you just know that the highlights will always be at plus two. They'll be bright, but they're not overexposed beyond recovery and then you just don't have to think about it again for the rest of the day. You see an animal, your camera's ready to go, your exposure's right, all you have to do is focus and shoot. It saves a ton of time for me and it allows me to get these images when I only have five seconds left. <laughs> yeah, I saw a little fox on the side of the road and he got spooked by some cars driving by. Ran out into this field and I, um, just kind of followed him out there, but just trying to be as unobtrusive as possible. So um, kind of, I have two cats at home and everyone always jokes that foxes are basically dog hardware running cat software. So I was just kind of using 
those interactions. So I was walking not towards him, just kind of diagonal, showing very little interest, not really making eye contact, trying to basically show that I wasn't a threat, moving slow. And uh, we had a great little encounter. He just kind of hung out with me. He could tell that I wasn't chasing him. And so um, I got a couple shots. The grass was really tall. I wasn't really able to get an unobstructed shot of his face, but I got some some really cute ones. And there was a moment there where he was giving me the slow blinks, which is kind of predator speak for like, I'm not threatened. When they close their eyes near you, it's like kind of a display of trust in the predator community. And I got a couple of those, which was how I knew I was safe to move a little bit closer as well. And thankfully with a long lens, you don't have to get too close. So that worked out. It was kind of fun. This is perfect lighting right now. I love the early morning light, but Unlike the bison we got at sunset earlier, um, those were front blasted with the sun. The sun was directly behind me. This time the sun's coming in at an angle and I love that. You need a little bit of a combo of sun and shadow to really bring out the definition of your animal. And this is just perfect conditions right now. Look at her, bold. There it is moving, you can see to the left. Two years maybe? Yeah, I mean, she's away from her mom, so at least two. At least two. But pretty small, little sow. It's moving left towards the road. There we go, ears. It's still pretty obstructed, but there she is with her cute little head. So most people think of grizzlies as carnivores, but they're actually omnivores. And this bear has been here all day, just kind of lounging around in the willows and the sagebrush. In the springtime, they love to dig up uh, the early spring roots. They're full of sugars and starches and they're very nutritious. And there's a lot of little like bugs and grubs that grow down there as well. So they get this full complex nutrition profile with some proteins and fats from the bugs and some starches from the roots. And so she's just out there probably digging holes. Grizzlies love to dig and just basically grazing. This is also a very Nate in the Wild experience to get so excited about a bear that you run outside and freeze to death a little bit. She's a little bit far off to the point where uh, the A1 was, she was a little too small in frame for me to get accurate focus. So I switched over to the A6700 because that crop sensor gives me just that little extra bit of reach, about 40% further. And so she fills the frame a little more and it makes my shots a little easier to get. <laughs> the little ears are so cute. Oh my gosh. Oh, look, her mouth's open. Hi, baby. baby. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, that was cool. Sweet. <laughs> I don't know if I got quite a portfolio shot, but I'm always just happy to see a bear. Yeah. That was cool. We thought we got stuffed and then... There she is again. Nobody likes mosquitoes. Except for bats. Really fortunate encounter. I was already hiking with this thing out. I just saw a mother black bear with two tiny little cubs. Uh, really, really tough shooting. She was you know, off the trail about 50 yards through the woods and they were moving parallel to the trail so they never got any closer to me. So it was really tough shooting through the branches but I got a couple that I really like and uh, it's kind of annoying to hike with a giant lens like this out but you never have time to get your camera set when you see an animal. So I always like to just hike ready to shoot. There's a big bumblebee doing circles around me. He probably thinks I'm dad. <laughs> he saw my shirt. Yeah, He's yeah. like, mom. <laughs> 
a trick I love to use for both photo and video. On the high resolution bodies like the A7R5 and the A1 is to program a hotkey, a custom button to put it into the Super 35 crop because that gives you a little bit more flexibility and a little more versatility with your lens selection. It's sort of tough shooting on primes to begin with, but if your prime is 400 millimeters, you're really locked into one specific frame. Uh, and it's kind of nice to be able to punch in 560 millimeters. You can get a little extra reach if the animal's kind of far away, and then as they approach, you just pop right back out. Uh, especially for shooting video, it's cool because you get that extra reach at no loss of resolution, because these cameras can shoot 4K both full frame and Super 35, which is really, really cool. And then on this camera, 62 megapixels or even 50 megapixels on the A1, that's plenty of resolution. I have printed 40 inches by 60 inches on an 11 megapixel photo. People used to print billboards in 2011 on those digital sensors, so don't stress out about the amount of resolution that you need in your final image. Don't be afraid to use crop as a tool in your bag. If the animal's far away, they're kind of small in your frame, take the best shot you can get because you might be truly surprised with how good that photo is after a little editing when you crop in. We have two elk over there, super far off. They're just kind of chomping on some, some grasses and stuff that are in the river. Um, we have this beautiful evening light, there's reflections. This is beautiful. Do you hear them? Yeah. Well, that was a perfect example of why I just call myself a nature photographer and not specifically landscape or wildlife because we came out here for just a beautiful sunset. We just kind of wanted to sit on this beautiful river and watch the sun go down. And we were treated to just beautiful wildlife photography also. We had a couple elk with a baby cross the river down there with some beautiful white birds flying behind them. It was genuinely some of my favorite photography of the whole trip, completely unexpected, and a perfect fusion between landscape and wildlife. Uh, it's just the best of both worlds. And so if a lot of this feels intimidating to you or a little bit overwhelming, uh, hire a guide. I can't stress enough how beneficial that can be in your journey. There are, are naturalists and professional wildlife guides in all of these national parks, Grand Teton, Yellowstone, Glacier, all over the country who get paid to know about these animals. They know where they're going to be, at what time of day, what they're doing, and they can help you learn how to find these animals and more importantly, how to safely interact with them so that when you go out, you can find these animals on your own and be safe while photographing them. And then beyond that, it's just about putting the time in, putting in the hours, go out and take a bunch of photos. Um, take some good photos, take some bad photos, and talk to yourself about which ones are which and why. And then eventually, a couple days down the line, you're gonna be surprised how many great photos you have in your portfolio.